I'm Sarah Morehouse, one of the librarians at Empire State College. In this video, I will introduce you to the idea of fair use and how it works within copyright law. Because copyright exists to promote intellectual and scientific progress, it needs to balance the needs of content creators with the needs of content users. In other words, an author's right to make money from their works can't be allowed to lock down those works so much that nobody can use them for purposes that are generally considered useful to society. Fair use is the part of copyright law that allows that balance to exist. Fair use isn't a clear-cut exemption like educational use. Instead, it's a flexible legal defense that you can use if you're taken to court for copyright infringement. Some people consider fair use risky because it's not cut and dry. Fair use is decided based on a balance of four factors, and it can seem to be a very subjective balance. The statute itself doesn't provide much guidance so we have to rely on decisions that come down from the federal courts and the Supreme Court to give us an idea of what constitutes fair use and what doesn't. This video will focus on how the four-factor balance works. Another video will address the various precedents that have implications for understanding fair use. You can also read through the copyright case studies to gain a deeper understanding of how fair use works. First, I'd like to clear up some confusions about what is and is not fair use. Just because your organization is a not-for-profit, or your use doesn't make you any money, doesn't necessarily mean it's fair use. Second, just because your organization is an accredited educational institution, or your use is strictly educational, doesn't necessarily mean it's fair use. Third, fair use does favor criticism and commentary, but simply being a critical work doesn't necessarily favor fair use and the creative, artistic, or dramatic nature of your use has absolutely no bearing on fair use. While fair use does favor transformative works that completely change and repurpose the original, just because your use is a remix or a mashup doesn't necessarily make it fair use. And finally, there are some urban legends going around about how much of a work you can use and it still qualifies as fair use. There is no safe number of words or pages, and no safe percentage of a work to use. Less is considered better, but people have been successfully sued for infringement for quoting only a couple of sentences. On the other hand, taking much more than that is sometimes considered fair use. It all depends on the four factors. Fair use is determined based on the balance of those four factors. That doesn't mean that all four factors have to be in favor. It just means that each of the four factors must be weighed, and as a whole, they must be weighing on the side of fair use. The first factor is the purpose and character of your use. This is the factor where it's advantageous to be doing something that copyright law explicitly considers socially beneficial. Those things are criticism and comment, including parody, news reporting, and education and research. It's also established that making a single copy of something for your own personal use counts as fair use. This includes things like putting mp3s on your iPod and photocopying journal articles in the library. The purpose and character of your use factor is where you take into consideration whether your use is transformative. Simply copying something is less likely to be favorable for the first factor than transforming it in some way. An example of a transformative work is captioning a music video to highlight examples of race and gender stereotypes. First you transformed its purpose. The old product was meant to entertain, and the new product is meant to provoke thought and educate. Second, you changed it by adding your own expression to it, so that the new product can't be substituted for the old one. The second factor is the nature and character of the work being used. Copyright law is explicitly meant to promote progress in knowledge, science, and technology. It never mentions promoting culture, literature, and the arts. Because of that priority, using a non-fiction work is more favorable to fair use than using a fictional, artistic, or dramatic work. Your use is more likely to be a fair use if you're using a published work. Unpublished works are more strictly protected. The reason is, if a work is unpublished, the copyright owner should have the right to reveal it to the world or withhold it in any way they choose. Someone else shouldn't get to usurp that. The third factor is the amount and substantiality of the work that is taken. There is no amount that's considered absolutely safe, but neither is there an amount that's definitely too much. When you're taking from a work, 
Think of how much you're taking in proportion to the work as a whole. But it's just as important to think about how significant what you're taking is to the work as a whole. If it's the heart or the backbone of the work, that's less likely to be fair use than if it's something minor or peripheral. The classic example is a case where a book reviewer took a few lines from a biography of President Gerald Ford. Normally that's a clear case of fair use, a short quote used for criticism and commentary. But the book reviewer lost the case because those few lines were the ones that revealed for the first time why President Ford chose to pardon Richard Nixon for Watergate. The court agreed with the copyright owner that that was the heart and soul of the work, and by taking it, the book review author had gone beyond fair use. Obviously, that's an extreme example. On the other extreme, parodies often get away with taking huge chunks of the original material. But to be safe, just take as little as you can from the copyrighted work and still accomplish what you need to do. And above all, pay attention to the other three factors. The de minimis defense is a special situation where a copyright owner's complaint is dismissed from the courts because the alleged infringer has taken such a tiny piece of the original or used it in such an obscure and incidental way that it's unrecognizable. There's no clear line, but cases that are considered de minimis generally involve pieces of the original work that are used in such a way that an ordinary observer wouldn't notice them, or at least wouldn't recognize them. For example, if a picture is hanging on the wall in a movie set, but it's partially behind a pillar and it never comes into focus, that's likely to be de minimis. If somebody's cell phone rings the first chord of a song during an interview for your documentary, that might be de minimis. The fourth factor is the effect on the market for the original work. Although it's only one of the four factors and it's listed last, if you pay attention to copyright decisions that are handed down, you can see that this factor weighs more heavily. That may or may not be right, but you need to take it into consideration when you're considering if your use is fair use. If somebody stands to lose money because of what you're doing, you're very likely to get in trouble. One thing you should never do if you want to claim fair use is copy a significant chunk of the original work and make it available in such a way that it can be taken back out of the context you put it in. For example, if you make a music video with a copyrighted song and a moving collage of your own pictures, you're making someone else's song available for free, even if you did add the pictures and your own original expression. Not only are you making it possible for people to listen to the copyright owner's song without paying them for it, you're competing with them for the market for music videos based on their song, and that market belongs to them exclusively until their copyright expires. In court decisions, the judges also take into account not just the market for the original work, but the potential market for derivative works that the copyright owner might want to make in the future. That means that if you've created a sequel, spin-off, or supporting material based on the original work, it may be unfavorable in terms of the fourth factor. One exception to all that is, again, parodies. Parodies may appropriate most of an original work and destroy the market for it, and that's considered acceptable because of the role parodies play in society as free speech critiques. But the rule is very strict, that for it to count as fair use, the parody needs to be mocking the original material or the ideas within the original material. If you appropriate someone else's copyrighted work to mock something entirely unrelated, that follows the same fair use rules as any other kind of criticism and commentary. So the four factors are one, how you're using the material, Two, what kind of material is it? Three, how much and how significant is the material you're using? And four, what effect will your use have on the market for the original material and its derivative works? All four of these factors have to be considered to decide fair use. They don't all have to be favorable, but the overall balance does. Click this link for a checklist that will help you calculate the balance of the four factors whenever you're trying to decide whether something is fair use. Next, I want to talk about fair use online. Some people say it can't be done. I say it can, but in very rare cases, and it's tricky. The reason for that is the fourth factor, market effect. The fourth factor is almost always catastrophically bad in the online environment. A person with a computer that's connected to the internet can make a theoretically infinite number of perfect copies, practically for free, and share them with anyone and everyone. The person's potential audience is worldwide. 
In other words, there are no natural barriers to flooding the market, as you can see from all the pirated music, movies, and TV shows that you can download. So in general, if you're going to put something online, you should get permission and not try to use fair use. But this isn't an absolute rule. You might be able to claim fair use online if the other three factors are in favor of fair use, and you make sure that you limit any negative market effect. There are two big ways you can limit your negative market effect. The first way is to make sure your use is a transformative use. That means you're changing its nature and its purpose. You have to create a remix or a mashup, not a copy. The product you create has to be something totally new that can't conceivably substitute for the original. And the second way to limit your negative market effect online is very simple. Limit access to it and limit people's ability to make copies of their own from it. To limit access, put it behind a password. Limiting people's ability to make copies is trickier, especially for images and text. But for audio and video files, put them on a streaming server rather than making them available for download. You should always include a notice that the content is copyrighted, and you should always cite the author. So if your other three factors are balanced in favor of fair use, and what you're doing is a thoroughly transformative use that can't substitute for the original, and you place solid restrictions on access and copying, it's probably safe to claim fair use online. But as you can guess, that doesn't happen very often. This concludes the fair use video. Because this is such a large topic, I've created a separate video concerning how fair use applies or doesn't apply in various scenarios, based on Federal Circuit and Supreme Court precedents. Please also see our other videos on what is copyright, public domain, getting permission, and more. You can also use the library's copyright information website as a quick reference.